no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. my mother's womb you have chosen me love has called my name I've been born again into your family your blood flows through my veins I'm no longer a slave
morning. Great to be in the house of the Lord. We've got even better things happening than I even knew of. I did know of it, but I didn't know that it was today. But we're going to have a baptizing in a little while. And I don't want anybody to leave till we do that. There had been a little bit of confusion. We had talked and we had got everything ready. And God run the water. Amen. Amen. I said, the water's not run. But Don said, yes, it is. I said, good. Everything's worked out. That's great. That's great. I think uh, uh, that is just wonderful. So we're going to have that. Kate Fleming, I saw her picture in the paper the other day. And there was a whole line of girls there. And I said, well, I see a winner. Now, I didn't know any of the other girls, but I see a winner. And uh, Diane and I talked about it, and Patty and I talked about it, and we all said, Kate's going to win that thing. Now, that didn't take anything away from those other beautiful ladies. But Kate is a beautiful lady inside and out, and she won. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Homecoming queen. Amen. What an honor. Beautiful young lady. Her life is that, that uh, she's just a winner. Amen. We got uh, a lot of good young people in this church. Hebrews chapter 13, if you have your Bibles. We're only going to use six verses today, but in that six verses is a lot being said. I want to bring out, they always tell you if you've got three points and a poem, you can have a sermon. I don't have a poem, but I got four points, so maybe we can make a sermon out of that, okay? As I was reading this and as I went to... Uh, Everything that happened this week just seemed to come to this. That's how God works sometimes. I had a lot of things going on in my ministerial life this week. And, and uh, even going to uh, Emmaus last night and Thursday night, we went to Simitonga. And, and everything that seemed to happen, happened about one of two of these points. I've even been getting phone calls <laughs> from prison and uh, uh, I told Diane I don't know anybody in that prison but I know a lot of people in prison but the phone calls just kept coming in and I never really got to talk to anybody because it was always on my voicemail or whatever but I know That God loves whoever it is that's trying to contact whoever they're trying to contact, whether it's me or not. So a lot of things began to come together, and I, I, I think God was putting these things in my mind for this sermon. Starting in the first verse, it says, keep on loving each other as brothers. Do not forget to entertain strangers. For by, for by so doing, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoner. And those who are mistreated as if you yourself were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all. And the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money. And be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, 
The Lord is my keeper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Six verses. Did you notice how many subjects were there? Now I'm going to only use four of them. But there were sermons all through there, even that we could make up uh, a, 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 a large sermon out of things that are there that we're not even going to talk about today. But I think four of those things stood out to me. Yesterday, I was hunting a, a, a cow. And I went to one of my neighbor's house and I said, look, if you see this calf, a cow, about 600 pounder, uh, call me. I said, it's, it's gone. It's out. The dogs had got in there and had had scattered uh, some uh, weaning calves that I had. And uh, we had found some at one neighbor's pasture and one at some uh, another neighbor's yard. And some uh, had got down in a couple pastures of mine down from where they're supposed to be. And, and uh, there's one that wasn't there. So I was out hunting the calf and, and I dropped in on a neighbor. I sat down and began to talk to him, and I realized pretty quickly that he was suffering. I knew he'd had cancer and surgeries and all kind of things, and, and I had visited during that time, and, and uh, my wife and I had helped him somewhat during that time. But I didn't realize that the suffering was still going on. I thought everything had got better and, and I had kind of neglected him. Neglecting going and checking on my neighbor. I found there wasn't much food in the house. I found that they didn't have much gas in their car. I found that he was not really just living the life of Riley. The bank had really been giving him a lot of trouble and they had finally negotiated and got his payments down to where it looked like he was going to keep his home. Now, I'm not a gossiping about my neighbor. I'm just telling you that I love that man. But see, I had neglected him. I had not gone and checked on him like I should have. And so this starts out and it says that we are to love our brothers. And sometimes I didn't intentionally do anything. I didn't intentionally not go check on him. We all get busy. We all are doing things and, and we think everybody else is okay. Or the phone would ring and they would tell you I'm hurting. So I've found what his needs were and they will be met today. You see, the Bible tells us to keep on loving. Not just because we think we're obligated, but because Christ so loved me that he died on the cross of Calvary when I was not worthy. When I was lost. Even before I was even born. He knew my name. 
Keep on loving each other as brothers. And, and I, I read it, I studied on that a little bit. It, it said it shouldn't be brothers, it should be love brother. Properly interpreted. And I don't know, I, I, I'm not a Greek scholar or Hebrew or all that, but brothers is okay with me, but it's a little more personal when I call you my brother. And you know, we become family when we become Christians. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're not just brothers. We become a brother. Or a brother and sister. And we're to take care of one another. It doesn't, he doesn't even go to my church. He's not of my denomination. Doesn't matter, does it? I've got a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ. That skin color is different to mine. I had a mess last night. I was there and, and I watched people worship. I love to watch people worship. There was a black guy that really worshipped last night. And you know what? For the last several times I've gone down there, I've seen some, and I don't, I'm not sure if they're Indian from India or if they're some other nationality, but they, they make me think so. And boy, they worship. They inspire me. They're my brother and sister in Christ. And the Bible tells me I'm to love them. Now I know with everything that goes on in the world sometimes, we get really kind of nervous about skin color. What people wear. People that are different to us. Well, let me tell you something. If we have one thing in common, and that is Jesus Christ, they are my brother and my sister. One thing. It changes everything. They are definitely at that point when they accept Jesus as their Savior, they become my brother or my sister. The next thing that I noticed jumped out at me is entertaining strangers. Now, I looked at that and I thought about that a little bit because I have entertained some strangers before. And, and sometimes I have wondered if God just directly sent them to me. Have you ever done that? Somebody you didn't even know, but you said, God must have known I needed them right then. Now, it might be in a human form that we talk about angels, or it could be if we were to go back in the Bible, we can find a lot of people that, that entertained angels. But I think there could be two interpretations here. Some people, human people, become our angels. I believe that. They do special things. God sends them with a special message. They have a special love for us. They, 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 they change our whole world. They change our lives. It could even be your wife or your husband. Or, or it could be somebody you've never known. Sometimes we're... A little skittish about entertaining people we don't know. And in this world, Satan would have nothing better than that. I know there's a great debate about taking in refugees right now, and, and it's scary. It really is. Sometimes there's a biblical thing that we need to turn to. I think God wants us to have common sense. You know, 
if a tornado is coming, I think he gives us the sense to get in a storm shelter or in a low place, okay? Common sense is a great thing. But common sense don't always tell us everything about everybody. Sometimes we just have to trust God. Sometimes we just have to step out on faith. Sometimes we just have to say he's big enough. In Sunday school, we had a great uh, little film a while ago about how big God is. Looked at the universe, and there's things about God that you and I, neither, we're never going to understand. He's so big. And then we go down to prisoners. You know, I guess Paul and Silas and some of the guys back then would say, you know, there's a lot of people that's incarcerated that are there for doing good, not bad. So we certainly ought to be praying for those that are incarcerated. We know some of them. They've been evangelists and, and they've been in foreign countries and they've been put in prison and, and some of them have been there for years. A few were released just a short time ago, and, and we've been all up in arms about did we give too much money to get them out and all these different things. And You've heard the arguments. What about our POWs? What about our prisoners of war? Do you ever stop and pray? For prisoners? What about even that guy that's done wrong or that lady that's done wrong and they've ended up in prison? Do you ever think that one thing could change their life? They could have a tart transplant and their life could be changed and not only would they be free from prison, even though they may never, may never get out, Preacher, how can they be free from prison if they never get out? Jesus sets us free. They can be free from what comes after prison. You ever thought about what comes after death? I'll tell you something. If you're a Christian, it's a good thing. If you're not, it's a horrible thing. And we're not going to get big into that today, but I want to tell you something. There's a place where the worm dieth not. When I see somebody that dies that I'm not sure is a Christian, it bothers me. Does it bother you? It ought to. It ought to burn in your soul. It ought to tear your heart out that you're not sure where they're going to spend eternity. There's people in prison. I've told you about going to the juvenile facilities and some of them, when they turn a certain age, they have to go on to prison. I've become acquainted with those guys and, and girls. It tears my heart out to see them go from juvenile detention on to prison. Some of them in my presence have accepted Jesus. Let me tell you something. A lot of wardens and a lot of people that work in prison don't understand these people. What a lot of them will tell you is, well, they got jailhouse religion. When they get out, they won't be like that. They think if they show themselves to be born again that some judge is going to set them free or that you're going to go out there and 
try to help them get out of what they've got into. All I know is they're a human being. All I know is a, heaven is a great place to inherit and hell's an awful place to spend eternity. And then there's marriage. Let me tell you something. So as marriage goes in this nation, so goes the nation. You don't read very far in the Bible. Start in Genesis 1 and you won't get very far till you see God ordained marriage. And God's never changed that. And God will never change that. Because God doesn't change. Culture change, fine. God won't change. The institution of marriage is so important to your church. Let me tell you something. A lot of people won't go to church because they're not married. And they figure they'll be judged, and they'll be criticized, and they'll be looked down on. A lot of children act up in school. Because their parents are not married. Now I counsel at school, so I can tell you this. Four out of five at least that I counsel, their problems stimulate from home. That's where it starts. I even counsel one a couple years ago that came from one of the wealthiest families that I know of. Let me tell you something. Money won't make kids happy. Huge gifts won't make kids happy. You know what kids, what makes kids happy? A mama and daddy at home that loves them. You want to talk about black on black crime? Black on black crime is almost 100% fatherless people that either kill or get killed. You know why? Because marriage is that important. Home life. Is that important? A mom and a daddy to a child, is that important? Marriage is about love. In the modern society, we've made it about a lot of things. I got a new show on where people are getting married to perfect strangers. Never seen them before. Well, I tell you what, you trust and look on that one. Marriage is about love and respect. Marriage is about far more than we want to make it today. Marriage is not a temporary situation. Marriage is for life. Let me tell you that. Marriage is when two Christians, a, a Christian young man and a Christian young girl, come together and God puts them together. It's not about what the preacher says. Not what the justice of peace says, what they do at the courthouse. It's not about some chapel up in the Smokies.
It's asking God to join you together in love forever. One university says that they can predict 87% correctly of which marriages will last and which will end up in divorce. I read that this week and I thought, hey, I can get pretty close to that number. 60% is going to fail anyway. I ain't got to give it 27 more percent, and I'm a pretty good guesser. They're a little more scientific than I am. You know what they said? You would think it, that it was, oh, well, both of them's in church, and both of them's got a good job, and both of them's this or that or the other. What they actually said proved out whether or not the marriage would, 87% of the time, is how they talk to one another. didn't say how much they talked to one another. It said how they talked to one another. If they talked to one another in love and respect in the way that they should, the marriage will last a big part of the time. If they're rude to one another, if they're down one another's throat all the time about whatever, it doesn't matter. Marriage will probably end up in divorce. You know, I took that and I said, you know, <laughs> I remember the old TV shows. Y'all remember Ozzy and Harriet? Some of them, they didn't even sleep in the same bed. They had, you know, twin beds in there. They didn't want anybody to even get the wrong idea on television back then. Well, let me tell you something. In marriage, you can stay in the same bed, okay? God gives you that permission. Out of marriage, you don't even need to be in the same room. You hear me? A lot of people don't like my preaching. I understand that. I have some of them say you're too hard on us. I'm going somewhere else because I don't, I don't want to hear that I'm living in sin. <laughs> I had a man and woman come to my office and a woman not long ago. Sit down and she began to tell me all the bad things her husband had been doing. They were bad. Really were. They involved a 15 year old girl. They were really bad. I scolded him. No, I burned him pretty good. I'll be honest with you. You know who got mad and wanted to leave? The wife that come told me that. I don't like what my husband's doing, but I don't want you scolding him. That's okay. They can find them a church where they don't care how they live. There's plenty of them out there. They can find a preacher that don't care. They'll tell them it's all about love. And that's all it is. There's no hell. There's no dangers of living out in the world. As long as you love one another, as long as you live good, pay your bills, you'll probably go to heaven. I'm going to tell you something. Without Jesus, none of us are going. You can mark that down. There is one way, one truth, and one life. You can mark it down. And you can get mad at me all you want to. But brother, if you're not if you're planning on getting to heaven any way other than by Jesus Christ, him crucified and rose from the dead, you ain't making it. How about Father Knows Best? 
Y'all remember that? Problem with that today is most people in some areas of our country don't even know who their father is. They don't know if he knows best or not because they've never met their father. I have a problem with some women that talk to me that they don't even know who the father of their children are. I guess they could have a test and find out, but Some of these that live in these drug houses. And I talk to a lot of them. Have children and they don't even know who their daddy is. Father knows best wouldn't be too good if you don't even know who your father is. Marriage is important, people. What about Dennis the Menace? Do you remember that? Oh, Dennis, he was a little menace, all right, but he had a mom and daddy that cared about him. They were trying to tell him the right way. He's a pretty good kid. He's just mischievous. You know what they do with mischievous kids today? They label them with some disease and give them medication. Many of them don't need medication. They just need a mom and daddy like that little Dennis the Menace had. That loved him. I'm not saying all of them don't need it. There's, a, I'm sure there's some that do. I'm not a doctor. But I'm going to tell you something. I've had a lot of experience with kids. Raised three, got six grandkids. I've been pastor in church for over 40 years. I've seen a lot of kids. And you know what most of them want? They want a family. They want loved. I wrote down some things that happens when marriage breaks down. I've covered some of them. I just want to say something about one or two others. And then I'm going to close. We're going to have a baptizing. We're going to have something fun. Something good. There's disease out there. Let me tell you this. Little girls and little boys are contracting these diseases. Grown men and women are contracting these diseases. I talk to parents and grandparents all the time that their hearts are broken because they've got a daughter or a son or a granddaughter or a grandson that's been infected by this. I even believe drug addiction sometimes comes from the pain of not having a good family. Now some of you are sitting there thinking, is he ever going to hush? I'm going to tell you. I see too much pain in the world. I see it because we don't love our brothers. We don't love and entertain strangers well. We don't care about those that are imprisoned and marriage has fell by the wayside.
God calls anything other than marriage sin. And I'm talking about between one man and one woman. Don't you hear that? You won't have to travel far to find you a church that will disagree with me. But you'll have to find a, go a long way to find a better book than this. And that's what it says. As a matter of fact, I believe you could circle the universe and you'd never find a better book, better instruction on marriage than this. If you're here, you come play a verse of song or whatever. If you're here and you need to accept Christ, you need to, whatever it is you need to do, the altar is always open. While this young man gets ready for, to be baptized, I want, to, I want you to understand that right here, right here, there's an answer to any problem you may have. I can't think of a one that you might not can find the answer to right here. Preacher, I want to, I want my life to change. This is where it'll start. We heard a sermon last night on the bomb of Gilead. Wow, what a sermon. He talked about how most of us want a Band-Aid, but the truth is we need a heart transplant. Most of us want a, a bomb that we can rub on our shoulder or our elbow or, or on our chest to make the pain go away. But what we need is a heart transplant. People, I don't know what you want. But if a heart transplant is what you need, they want anything else fix it. If Jesus is what you need, Nothing else will fix it. As we stand. In the morning when I rise In the morning when I rise In the morning when I rise Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this. Just give me. Oh.